so it's 10, it's a little bit after 10. So before we get started, like I said, I just want to have a brief discussion. So the bishop has given us new guidelines, all right? And I think, I think Ellen just emailed them out, but y'all can read those um, later. But we, we want to try, or we want not try, we plan <laughs> to start moving back to some in-person meetings, right? Um, and to address what Margaret brought up, Margaret said, well, what about people who are able to zoom in? Okay, well, that's important because that's a lot of people in our lectionary class. Mm -hmm. um, and so the ideal situation is that we can do both. Um, but we would like to encourage people who feel comfortable, obviously, um, to, to join us at the church. And we will have, you know, we've got that portable big screen TV thing that we can move around and it hooks up to the internet. Um, and so we'll, we'll have that component. Um, so basically what, what the bishop said is that we can meet together in person uh, in small groups, and, you know, the great thing about Bishop Jose is that he has, it's not defined extensively, right? What's a small group? That's for us to decide. Obviously, this is a small group. If the six of us were <laughs> together, we can meet just fine. But I think we're thinking maybe even up to 20 people um, that we could fit in Heinz Hall comfortably. And, we, you know, we still have to maintain those three feet of distance is what they're calling for now, um, especially if, if everyone's been vaccinated. Now, we're not going to have people show vaccination cards. It's basically initially going to be, hey, if you've been vaccinated, let's we can take our masks off if we all feel comfortable and blah, blah, blah. We may initially still have masks in person in that way, but, you know, we're able to open doors and windows and, and that kind of stuff. So that's what we're moving to. Uh, and I just wanted to let y'all know about that because we want to do that next Tuesday <laughs> uh, if if we can. And so it's it's kind of, I don't know how long we need to talk about it here. I just would like to either just briefly, if, if y'all think that's a terrible idea, let me know. Um, but if you think that you're comfortable with that, also let me know just quickly uh, and we'll Sounds we'll good. Sounds good. Yeah. Uh, Murdoch, next uh, Tuesday, I will not be here because there's a retirement celebration that I'm part of for one of my colleagues. So I don't want you to think that I'm not here <laughs> because I didn't like the change, because I <laughs> do like the change, but okay, I just great. can't be two places at once. I've tried unsessfully for it years. Is hard to do. <laughs> okay, great. And, and for people who aren't in cashers, obviously, or in the surrounding area, we will have the Zoom component and, you know, there might be a bit of a learning curve. <laughs> uh, and also, unfortunately, um, Collins and, and Ginger and Maisie, I don't think y'all are on here. I, I'm in my, at my house because at this point today, I can't even open an email in my office. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that's just my office where it's located, I think. We're hoping to get that worked out you know we're trying to do all this stuff with high hampton where we're sharing their internet and it's just not going well um yeah, and i don't have a way to hardwire in so ellen luckily luckily for us for everybody ellen can hardwire in to the modem but um i can't because i'm on the other side of the building and you know i just don't have that ca capacity so um that could be like we did our um Inquirers Episcopalian 101 course last night, and we were able to Zoom some people in. Um, it was kind of basically a conference call <laughs> because we couldn't get them to pull up on the screen because of the internet. But we're still working on that, and we're hoping that it's going to get better. And anyway, long story short, there will be a way for people to Zoom in and join, even though we're looking to move to in-person gatherings. Laura Flaherty, I was just telling everybody that starting next week, we're hoping to have in-person lectionary with a Zoom component. Um, following the bishop's guidelines, following the CDC guidelines, little the spacing's gotten less, but we're still going to try to remain distanced and and that kind of stuff. So, Murdoch. Yes, ma'am. Um, 
I believe that um, next Tuesday, um, Laura and Ginger and I are going to be at DOK. In that, in that next week. That's right. Yeah, for y'all's retreat. Yeah. Yeah. Twelve. Yeah. So, just. Yeah. And that's okay. Bye. Bye. But, yeah. Thank you for letting me know, and that's fine. And and we'll keep gathering the best. We're going to keep doing lectionary class. <laughs> so, <laughs> in, the, in the future, we're um, just looking to meet in person. So let me go ahead and share my screen so that we can get started with what we're doing here. Okay. Um, that isn't quite how I want that to look. Hold on just a sec. There we go. <clears throat> Can you make it bigger? Yeah, yeah uh, I'm on a different down. <laughs> um, Yes, I know I can. Here it is. <laughs> there you go. That's there. better. There we go. So um, I'm going to go ahead and open us in prayer. As I like to do, I'm going to use the collect for this upcoming Sunday. So this is the collect for the sixth Sunday of Easter. Let us pray. O oh God, you have prepared for those who love you such good things as to pass our understanding. Pour into our hearts such love towards you that we, loving you in all things and above all things, may obtain your promises, which exceed all that we can desire. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. So I think... Um, as we move through the lectionary, and if you've been able to read uh, any lectionary, I think this, um, how this colic points us to loving uh, God and, and the love that God has for us really speaks to the, the gospel and to the first John reading that we'll get to. But before we get to that, we will begin with Acts. And Collins, would you like to read this for us this morning? Yes. Thank you. Acts 10, verses 14 through 48. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. God. Thank you. So if you remember, um, I guess it was last week when we were talking about the Ethiopian eunuch. Um, and that was uh, from Acts of the Apostles, and that was a scene of belief and then baptism. Uh, and then we kind of briefly talked about how some people place that as the beginning of the Gentile mission in Acts, or some people um, place the big Gentile beginning of Acts with Cornelius. I think that's really the more traditional view, uh, and this is what we're talking about right here. So Peter um, gets a vision a little, this is like the leading up to verses, and it's basically told to go to this guy's house, so his household, right, and his household, you know, we're, we're thinking in, in terms of what people considered a household in the Greek times, right, this isn't just my household today, which would be Mary Catherine and I, and I. that's that's our household, there's two of us. <laughs> um, in this sense, with Cornelius, this would have been many people, so his family, possibly cousins, aunts and uncles, maybe his wife and children, but also servants. Anyone who was in this house making it work would have been there. And so that's where we see this, and all who heard the word. This is speaking of Cornelius and his household, who were all Gentiles. Um, and then we, we move forward and we hear that um, the Holy Spirit has been poured out on these people. And what happens is Peter is, is giving this long well, not necessarily very long, but it's a long speech 
uh, and is, face, is giving the good news, which is Christ crucified, died, and resurrected. That's what he's talking about. Uh, and, and this is where we come in. And, the, um, and it says, while Peter was speaking, this happens, and it interrupts him. And, uh, and then the speech is over because everyone receives the Holy Spirit, and they start speaking in tongues and extolling God and all these things. And so this is the important part. Well, this is all important, but real important to hear where Peter says, can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he's recognizing that what happened to him uh, and the other disciples and apostles on the day of Pentecost, where they received the Holy Spirit, so this is Acts of the Apostles, when they received the Holy Spirit like tongues of fire, and they start speaking in tongues, but people understand each other and all these things. He's like, this is also happening right now in front of me with Cornelius in this household. And how can we deny that? How can we not see that it's happening? Um, and so then they're all baptized. And Peter stays for several days. And the idea is that he then continues to preach the good news to more people. And so this is the Gentile mission beginning with Peter. He also then, after these several days, goes and defends himself, but we'll see that in some later um, readings from Acts, because not everybody agreed, right? So we know um, this idea that even the Spirit's being poured out to Gentiles, while right now Peter is recognizing that is a good thing. How can we deny that? This is happening. We're seeing it. Not everyone agreed with him initially. Um, but as we know, um, through our tradition and history, that the good news did spread, <laughs> and there was, no, there was no stopping it, in a sense. The Holy Spirit was not to be contained. Um, and so, yeah, I think this is a really, a really neat kind of short reading, but we see a whole lot happening, and we see that the, um, the good news of Jesus Christ continues to spread. And that's a good thing. So I'd love to hear what y'all think about this reading. Murdoch, I have a question. It might be kind of a strange question, but is there an order to receiving the Holy Spirit and being baptized? I mean, is one supposed to precede the other? <laughs> I don't Well, it's interesting. That is like, that's kind of one of the, if we were, you know, we're having a lectionary class. If we were to have a, a reading of the church fathers class, <laughs> uh, we would see that uh, that question, you're, you're not the first person to ask that question, right? And it's a good question. Um, it seems like it goes both ways. Uh, one, the, the main answer would be think about Jesus's baptism. Uh, obviously, we know Jesus is, is the son of God. Jesus didn't need to be baptized, <laughs> but he is baptized. And when that happens, something happens after that. Um, whatever we want to say that is. The voice of God comes, the Holy Spirit descends like a dove, um, but we also know that then Jesus gives the Holy Spirit to other people. But in other parts of Acts, it seems to happen the way that maybe our theological understanding would, would speak to now, which is, uh, you know, you're sealed as Christ's own forever, receive the Holy Spirit, fully initi initiated into the, the Christian church is the way we, we, we view that now. But Obviously, you can't really argue with scripture. <laughs> the Holy Spirit <laughs> descended on these people, and then they were baptized. So that's kind of one of those, um, basically, you could say it's one of those age-old questions that there's not really a definitive answer to, other than, um, you know, like we, th like we think about baptism, right? Baptism is a sacrament initiated by Christ. If we think about the word sacrament in Greek, mysterium, it's a mystery, <laughs> uh, and there's really not a, there's not a definitive answer. So it's a great question, but so, well, this, there's as you, as kind of like the chicken and the egg. Yeah, <laughs> no. which came first? <laughs> but as you said, Mark Murdoch, as in this instance, uh, you can't argue with the Holy Spirit. These people had not been baptized, but he, the Holy Spirit came upon them. So I don't think it matters to God which. Uh, order it comes in mm -hmm. it's the you know if yeah. murder okay. and Laura yeah. Flaherty yes Colin. I believe that there were some uh, 
actions taken by Cornelius and maybe his family or his household that preceded Peter speaking and preceded the Holy Spirit. As I recall, Cornelius was a, uh, a generous, uh, caring man, and, I, and he was recognized, I believe, maybe for even being God-fearing. Uh, but the point is, is that this wasn't just Peter and the Holy Spirit. There, there, was, there were actions uh, that preceded it. Now, I'd like to shift to a more mundane matter. Um, in the reading, the word Gentiles is capitalized. And in your notes, uh, in the sentences, uh, Gentiles is lower, uh, Gentile is lowercase. Normally, I used to think that the capitalization meant that it was a proper noun. Now, uh, do you have any comment on the whether or not Gentiles were considered a proper noun? Um, well, <laughs> yes, I, I do. But also, um, please don't take my notes as being... <laughs> um, most of these were typed very quickly. Um, and I didn't really go back and edit them. I, I did not even, I didn't. So, but uh, yeah, so the word Gentiles, interestingly, um, it can also be translated into nations, which often does get capitalized uh, when they're talking about these people, because the word Gentile, you know, is it goes back to um, the Hebrew scripture. Often when you see God will go to the nations, that's the same idea. Um, it's the same idea as Gentile, anyone who's not a Jew, <laughs> uh, which at that point was everyone in the world outside of um, that specific area. I think it can go both ways, Collins, but I feel like I don't know if I'm necessarily the right person to answer that. I believe that it's capitalized on purpose in scripture because I think it is treated as a people, you know. Um, it is a generalization because Gentiles, is a, it's not sp speaking of just a specific group of people in an area, it's all these people. Right there, they're talking about Cornelius' household. But I think they use it to designate people. So I think you could say that it could be a proper noun, but we might need a, a better expert to answer that specific question. Thank, thank you. Anybody else have any comments on our Acts reading today? Awesome. Let's move on to the Psalm. Um, I really do love these questions, all these questions, but specifically thinking about baptism because reading about baptism in Acts of the Apostles, I think is just really fascinating to me because it is, it does, it means so much to our tradition and seeing, seeing how it played out in its early days. It's really interesting. I just have a short little comment about that. Yeah. It seems, it seems um, interesting to me that um, uh, Peter ordered them to be baptized. I mean, it's an odd word, seems to me. Um, yeah. I invited them to be baptized. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, you're right. That is interesting. I feel like the way that I read that is that he ordered <laughs> maybe the other people that were with him to accept them being baptized. Yeah. Exactly. Um, that's how I, I see it, as opposed if to him ordering. If there was involved, that would be, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'd like to follow up on last week's reading about uh, the baptism of the Egyptian eunuch in the uh, roadside ditch mm -hmm. and how uh, the uh, eunuch was the one that, you know, asked, was there any, is there any reason why I can't be baptized? Look, there's water, you know, and this wasn't Philip saying, that, look, hey, uh, I think I need to baptize you before you get back to yeah, Egypt. Uh, it's interesting that in that particular case, the calling was coming from the seeker rather than, you know, uh, coming from a, an apostle. And the Holy Spirit nudged him. That's right. Yeah, I mean, ex I think you're exactly right to point that out, Collins. And like, we're, I think that just kind of continues our bigger discussion that the, the views or the way that baptism is presented throughout Acts of the Apostles 
is quite different in, in different scenarios. Um, I feel like that this could be like an upcoming class, like all about baptism. Uh, Just because we're not supposed to put the Holy Spirit in a box. You can't, no. <laughs> he blows where the wind, as the wind blows. <laughs> That's right. Well, let's move on to the psalm so that we can hopefully make it through everything. Um, we don't have Rich and Mary with us today. Would anyone like to volunteer to read our psalm? I'll read it. Thank you, Maisie. You want me to read just straight through or you want to yeah, read it? Yeah, just go ahead and read it, read it all uh, yourself if you don't mind. Okay. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. With his right hand and his holy arm has he won for himself the victory. The Lord has made known his victory. His righteousness has he op openly shown to the house of Israel. And all the ends of the earth have seen the victory of our God. Shout with joy to the Lord, all ye lands. Lift your voice, rejoice, and sing. Sing to the Lord with the harp, with the harp and the voice of song, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Shout with joy before the King, the Lord. Let the sea make a noise and all that is in it, the lands and those who dwell therein. Let the rivers clap their hands and let the hills ring out with joy before the Lord when he comes to judge the earth. Comes to judge the earth in righteousness shall he judge the world and the peoples with equity. Thank you. So um, I meant I, I, I realized when you're reading that, Maisie, that I, I made a mistake and didn't mark something. So what I was wanting to try to to show with my highlights here was the continuation from this act story uh, through the psalm. So I highlighted for he's done marvelous things. I mean, I think about the Holy Spirit descending on these Gentiles and how shocked everybody was and then how they accepted it. But just even to our what we were just talking about right here in verse three, the Lord has made known his victory, his righteousness he has openly shown in the sight of the nations. Right. So once again, as we think about the idea that the word nations, you can interchange that with Gentiles. We see it right here. Um, the ends of the earth, yeah. Yeah, and then, and then we move to the ends of the earth, to everyone. So it's moving. The righteousness that God is showing to everybody. Um, and then I highlighted at the very end, in righteousness he shall judge the world and the peoples with equity. So this is almost an equalizing statement. Um, God's going to judge everybody <laughs> uh, to the ends of the earth with equity. So that, those are the things that I kind of picked up. There's a lot, you know, this is a, a joyful psalm. Um, mm. in a lot of ways um you know there is there is some like you know talk of victory and like what does that mean exactly but the way that i'm reading it is really a, a joyful tone uh and verse one also speaks to one of my favorite hymns uh <laughs> sing to the lord a new song for he has done marvelous things anyway uh, <laughs> i love that hymn i want to praise him with a new song so yeah, I think that this is a good continuation. It speaks pretty cleanly, I think, from Acts moving into John. John, First John and the Gospel of John kind of move into this continuing with abiding and love and all these things. But, you know, the Lord opening up his righteousness to the nations and to the ends of the earth, I think, really is a good psalm to pair with our Acts reading. So does anyone else pick up anything from this psalm today? Or I got picked up. Go ahead, Laura. Go ahead. I was just going to tag on to his reference to earth and all stars on um, the hymn because we've got the lands, we've got the sea, we've got the rivers. Um, it doesn't specifically mention the stars, but I'm sure that they are included as well. I think you're right. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Murdoch, I think I heard you say that the in the earlier reading that the Holy Spirit descended on just the Gentiles. Wasn't it all of them? Uh, I, I don't have it in front of me. Now you can bring it up. Uh, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word, which I believe meant that it was not just uh, the Gentiles, but mm -hmm. it would uh, perhaps 
Peter was there with some of his pals, but it, what do you what do you say? You know, is, is it that uh, the Holy Spirit's leaving Peter out? Or? No. <laughs> um, I guess the way I'm that I read curious. that. No, the way that I read that, and you know, we know that the Holy Spirit had already descended on on Peter and the rest of the uh, disciples on the day of Pentecost. Uh, I certainly think we can continue to receive the Holy Spirit in different ways. So I'm not trying to exclude Peter. I guess I was just thinking of, for the Gentiles, this was a new experience. Uh, they were receiving the Holy Spirit for the first time. Um, so, yeah, no, I definitely wasn't trying to exclude anybody, but just thinking about uh, the, new, the new folks who had received it for the first time. I think Peter and his, his compatriots could have easily been moved by the Holy Spirit there as well, or be continued to move by the Holy Spirit. You know, I don't, I don't think I know exactly what their experience was, but um, they had received the Holy Spirit once before, continuing to receive it. But for the new Gentiles, this was a this was a new experience for Cornelius and his household. Was how I was thinking about that. We often see that uh, and, and marvel at how the selections in the lectionary complement each other and echo each other. And so along with that, you know, trying to figure out uh, if it's everybody, if you look at verses four and five of the psalm, all the ends of the earth, and then shout with joy to the Lord, all you lands, that's all people are invited. So mm -hmm. I think that it, it yeah. inclusivity. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and th this continues that idea, you know, Jesus speaks of this when he's fulfilling the scriptures, um, this, this idea that God, it's, it's always important to remember that those who, who were worshiping God, the Jews and the Hebrew scripture, thought that this was going to happen eventually, that everyone was going to see that they were right, <laughs> and this one God was the, was the victor, um, that, was, that was already an idea that was in place, um, and that, you know, part of Jesus fulfilling those scriptures was God going out throughout the world. So it's, it's important to always remember that. Um, and then you're right, uh, Laura, it is, it is an equalizing thing. All the lands shout and sing with joy. Verdict, I would be remiss if I did not compliment Maisie I marvel at the way Maisie pronounces pronounced marvelous. It was just <laughs> inspiring. Maisie, great job. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> very nice. So let's go ahead and move on to um, to First John. Unless anybody has anything else to say about the psalm, I certainly don't want to move too quickly. Um, but I will ask. Uh, Laura Flaherty, would you be willing to read this for us? First John 5, 1 through 6. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, for whatever is born of God is the world. And this is the of the world, our faith. Who is it come to the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, not with the water, but with the water. And the Spirit is the one that testifies. For the spirit is the truth. Thank you. Um, okay, so this is this is if you remember last week's reading from First John, um, and you did a marvelous job reading this, Lauren. This is one of those the scriptures that is a bit complicated in a way, like it's going in a circle, and this is how I described described this first paragraph. The first thing to, to remember is what, when you, read, when you read this translation that says, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, we should always remember that when we see is the Christ or when we see Jesus Christ, 
that we remember, and I don't know if I necessarily have to say this, but that's not Jesus's last name, right? <laughs> Christ is a is a is a holder for Messiah. <laughs> Jesus is the Messiah, is what this author is saying. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah has been born of God. So that's the first kind of qualifier here. You know, th this is setting up some qualifiers. We, we have to, first John is sometimes, I mean, it's great, it's beautiful, but it does, it does, um, it's, it's not quite as equalizing as, as when we hear the Psalm says that everyone in the world is going to lift up their voice and sing. But this is beautiful, a very important passage. But everyone who believes that Jesus is the Messiah has been born of God. First thing first. Um, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. So this is some beautiful language in the sense that you believe this and then you also love the parent. So that's God. And by that, we love the children of God. Um, if we, uh, as I say here, if we love God, then we love God's children. By this, we know that we love the children of God. There we go. When we love God and obey his commandments. So then after we've done all these things, we accept Jesus. We love God's children. Um, as with First John, that also means that we're called to action. We're called to love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments. Basically, following that up with saying the same thing again. So it's really important. <laughs> uh, and his commandments are not burdensome. So then, then, we're, then we're, we're reminded that this isn't something that we should feel is a burden. It's something that we want to do. For whatever is born of God conquers the world. So then, then for a split second, we're kind of like, oh, we're going to conquer the world. But <laughs> uh, the author of 1 John then reminds us what that means. And this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. So our faith, it's not a violent conquering of the world. Um, it's a faithful conquering of the world. Um, so I kind of read that as, as once again, this, this word of God, the good news of Jesus spreading. And who is it that conquers the world but the ones that believe Jesus is the Son of God? So in the, uh, in the commentary I was reading, it, it, it really just drew a circle and it said these things. This is what happens. You believe in Jesus. You believe in God. You love God's children. You do God's commandments. And then you, you're conquering the world by your faith. And it's a continuation. It's always happening. Um, always happening in us and al always happening also when, when new People um, hear the word of God and believe, or when, when all these, these things continue to happen. And I loved this. This was something that really struck me when I was reading about this. Uh, and the author said that this is not stressed enough. Um, and it's when we, we go back up here to the beginning, it says, when we love God. <laughs> you know, we, oft, we so often hear how much God loves us. But the, uh, the author of, um, of this commentary was saying, this is the important thing also, too, that we love God. <laughs> it's not a one-way street, right? Uh, it's a back and forth. It's a mutuality. God loves us. We love God. We also are called to do something. Uh, and part of that is to love God as well. Um, and obviously, yeah, God's love and grace are freely given to us. But we also have to reciprocate that love. Um, and so I think that that's a beautiful, a beautiful um, part so then we come to this last little, little bit, and this is this is really interesting. Um, this is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ, and then once again restating the the fact. So it's important, not with the water only, but with the water and the blood. Um, and that's kind of a, it's an odd comment, I think, um, and it's it's also debated on what exactly. The author is getting at. Uh, and I gave us three, three um, options here of what that e exactly means. So one, uh, and I like this interpretation, but it's not one that people think it might have been on the mind of the author. But this is the great thing about scripture, right? The scripture is alive. Scripture is always being interpreted. Um, so water represents Christian baptism and the blood represents Eucharist. That's one interpretation. Um, second, Water alludes to Jesus's baptism and the blood to his to Jesus's crucifixion. So it's more about Jesus, which that's really the one that a lot of people tend to um, lean to. And then finally, water and blood both 
recall Jesus's crucifixion because if, if we remember when Jesus's side is pierced, water and blood pour out together. So I think all of those are are perfectly acceptable, and it's just it's just kind of what what moves us. And then the final statement, and the Spirit is the one that testifies for the Spirit is truth. Um, this is where we think about the uh, First John and John's Gospel. Then we need to keep those a little bit compartmental, compartmentalized, compartmentalized, because this is really a statement about the Holy Spirit being the Paraclete, being the advocate for Jesus, the one who brings the truth about Jesus. When we receive the Holy Spirit, then we are part of Christ's body because we've come to understand that going back to the very beginning, Jesus is the Christ and the Holy Spirit helps to intensify that belief because um, it because the Spirit is the truth. It's the one that testifies the truth. As Jesus said, there's one who's coming in my name, the Spirit, the advocate for me. Um, and so, yeah, that closes that out. It's almost, it's almost a nice little pit of scripture where at the end we're reminded the spirit is the truth because those who receive the spirit know that jesus is the christ um so those are my thoughts on that i'd love to hear what you think about it well, murdoch thank you for pointing out that <clears throat> the commandments are not a burden but a gift uh, i think god's law these commandments are intended to guide our lives not to make us feel guilty and so by loving and obeying God it leads to a life of of joy and meaning uh, commandments you know sounds it just sounds a little strong but um you're, you're right they're not a burden they are a gift yeah I think no, they're right like a parent our, the, our parents um uh, guidelines are given for a child's protection. You know, you don't run in the street because you, it won't go well. <laughs> and I think God's commandments are sort of the same way that if we, if we break those things, it, it, it causes bad things to happen. I mean, the consequences are. So I think they're for, partly for our happiness and protection as well. Yeah, right on. Does anybody else have any thoughts today on this? On obedience. Yeah. Uh, yes. Obedience normally starts in its natural state out of fear. When fear progresses to love obedience then becomes not the burden the Reason. burden is is only when it when there is unbelief and it's very understandable why those who do not believe that jesus is the christ why they uh, feel burdened by the commandments and I think it's at that transitional point in a person's life, in ev every individual person's life, when they uh, make the transition to believing that they become uh, a loving, obedient uh, child of God. There's a, an element of um, our response to him when we know and love him we want to please uh, and and follow you know follow his his direction yeah yeah all very good points it's interesting um, and it's it's i think this is this these two readings first john and then what we're about to read in the gospel really do uh, complement each other um, because you know commandments of God, uh, you know, there's a lot of different ones, <laughs> but um, we're about to hear Jesus's commandment, um, which I think partially is what this is. This is remembering. Um, this reading is remembering what we're about to hear next. But you're right. I think 
you know, that, that's why I really do love, uh, Collins, you're right. That's why I really do love the, uh, the saying that, um, you know, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of God. Uh, it is a, it is a different, um, kind of fear. Uh, I like to think of it not as, you know, being afraid so much, but, um, but wanting to obey in that sense. So, uh, thank you for that. All right. Anybody else want to chime in on this reading from first John? All right, well, I'm going to move us on to the gospel, and I'll read this for us today. And there's, there's quite a bit to take in. Jesus said to his, this is a reading from the gospel of John. Jesus said to his disciples, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my Father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. Here ends the reading. So this gospel reading continues right where we left off last week. Um, and it continues with two of the same themes. Uh, first is the abiding. If you remember, uh, abide in me as I abide in you. It's, it was all throughout the gospel last week. And then if we remember how verse eight ends from last week's gospel, um, and I don't have my um, Bible right in front of me, unfortunately, but it says that uh, to be real disciples, basically, you have to glorify God, and you're doing, and Jesus is doing all these things, and we're going to do all these things for the glory of God, and so the Father, God the Father is Jesus, the language that he uses here is at the root of all that Jesus does, and thus at the root of all that the disciples do, and that theme continues throughout the Gospel of John. I do all these things to glorify God, Jesus says many times. Um, so Jesus loves the disciples, and so they must abide in his love, just as the Father has loved me. So we see that Jesus is using this, this same kind of language. I did all these things because the Father has loved me, so that I love you, so abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love. Um, so once again, this is a call to do something. <laughs> it's not just abiding in Jesus's and God's love and just saying, oh, it's all great. We have to keep Jesus's commandments. And it's and here's the interesting thing he always does here, just as I've kept my father's commandments and abiding. So it's constantly to do what Jesus has done. You know, we're using Jesus as the example. And here, this is the great thing here. And he says, I've said these things and I do these things so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Um, and the word complete when, it, when I was reading a bit about this, um, it, it really should should be interpreted um, as saying, like, this should be enough. <laughs> you don't need anything else. Jesus's love and his command to you should be enough. And that's your joy. That's how your joy is complete, um, because you're accepting these things. I thought that was a really interesting uh, way to look at that. And I, I tend to agree. I tend to agree with it. And so then Jesus continues on with now, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Um, so it's a continuation, of, this is what I was saying, of the previous things that we've heard, but also we have to remember what happened before this. It's also a continuation of when Jesus says, if you remember at the foot washing, he says, if you listen to me and do this, then you're doing what I've asked you to do, and that's to love one another. So we're, all this is kind of playing out together. Um, and with Jesus finally saying, this is my commandment that you love one another. I've showed you how to do this. And I'm going to show you even more. <laughs> as is kind of also what he's doing here when he says, 
No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. And Jesus is alluding to this is what's about to happen too. I've showed you foot washing. I've told you to abide in my love. And throughout all this, I've showed you how to do this because I've been doing it for God this whole time. And you should too. And to lay down one's life is the greatest gift of all time. Now, as we know, that's a difficult thing to do. And Jesus is laying down of his life for the world is something that only Jesus can do. But we are to remember that Jesus is showing us how to do the greatest gift of all time. But he also then puts a new little twist on it for his disciples when he says, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Um, and he makes this an even, an even greater thing. It's kind of like, I wish this line would have come first. You did not choose me, but I chose you. When he makes it, cl it clear that, yes, he's now saying, you are my friends. The greatest gift of all time is to lay down one's life, one's life for his friends. But you did not choose me. I chose you. Jesus is always seeking us out. He's always seeking out his disciples, and he seeks us out as well. Um, and the Greek word for this is philio. So it's the same, same idea of um, if we're, we think about Philadelphia. The love of one's friends. This was a, a great gift that Jesus is giving to his disciples here, especially when he's like, I no longer call you servants. You are my friends. We're moving into a new direction here. Um, and then he continues on, tying this back into what we heard last week, um, is saying like, he wants us to bear fruit, fruit that will last. I think this is a really important bit. It's not, you know, it's not just things that are kind of one-off or, or like wishy-washy kinds of things. I appoint you to bear fruit, fruit that will last. Um, and then once again, Jesus, as he always does here, the gospel of John, he doesn't forget to include, to include God the Father. Um, so that when you, when you pray in my name, so this is a new commandment also too, in a sense, Father, the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. Um, but at the root of it, we are to, to include God the Father in these requests, in these prayers. The way I think about that is, you know, you know, closing prayer in the name of Jesus. I think this is, this is kind of the beginning of that tradition. Um, and then ties it all back in together by reiterating the, what he begins with here. And I'm giving you this command so that you may love one another. I mean, that's the important thing. Um, and this time he doesn't, he doesn't kind of tie in the, as I have loved you, this is a general, this is like, bam, hard stop. I'm giving you this command so that you may love one another. The important bit that Jesus ends with there. Okay, so there's a lot going on, <laughs> I feel like, in these, in these statements, but uh, I would love now to hear what, what y'all took from this. Well, all the readings this week, there's just so much love and joy in them. But, you know, again, it's, it's up to us to accept that love, um, to abide, to bear fruit. Um, but, yeah, these readings really go together this week for me. They fit. Exactly. I agree. One thing that jumps out at me in these, though, is that, that all of these things say, if you obey my commandments... You are my friends. If you obey my commandments, you will abide in my love and joy. And scripture is pretty clear that, that God knows that we can't always do that. And it doesn't depend on how well we do that um, to have his love. And, and, and yet this does seem to come across as very, um, leg, a lot of legalism, um, that is crippling and, and, and uh, you know, causes a lot, a lot of guilt and shame and, and mental illness. <laughs> yeah, Maisie, it's a great, I'm really glad that you bring that up. Um, you know, I, I understand what you're saying and I agree with you to an extent. I, I don't know if I would say it's necessarily legalism because I, I, that, that sometimes is kind of like, uh, it's so, is so harsh. I think there are a lot of qualifiers here. If you do this, then you do this. But as you've already said, we know um, that there's forgiveness and we know that we can ask for forgiveness and know that we can't always live up to these lofty expectations 
that we hear from Jesus or the that's lofty why expectations. He, yeah, that's why he came and died because he knew we couldn't. And his grace comes to us because of his life and resurrection. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. uh, and I know that this is not, you know, the scripture is very clear in other places. And so I don't, I know it, that John is not saying that, you know, you walk the straight line or you're not Jesus' friend and he doesn't love you. It's, I know he's not saying that, mm -hmm. but it does, you know, um, ring of some of that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think for me, the comfort that I find in it is that um, I believe that, you know, you're right, there, there can be a lot of, of issues with this. But at the same time, I feel like in this way, Jesus is telling us he does expect a little something from us. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just, it is. Our good. intention is to obey yeah. him. Our, our desire is to be, obey him. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Thank you so much for that. Would anybody else like to share? Collins, I can't hear you. I don't know if you're. He's muted. Thank hey. you all for letting me know that I was. Okay, muted. there you go. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'd like to focus on the word abide. There are three abides, uh, and they're all verbs. When you move the, ver the verb into the noun category, you will get the word abode, which we might see more commonly in our culture rather than abide. Abide is one of those kind of, if you will, old words, whereas abode may be more current. And I can see uh, the two Laura's abodes where they abide. <laughs> and uh, the same for you, Murdoch, since your uh, connections at the church are not as good as at, at home. But it's if you substitute the word abode for love, you will pick up an understanding in this reading. In other words, Jesus is saying, uh, uh, abide in my love. You know, it's abide in my home. His home is love. But then he's also saying it again. You know, if, you know, you will abide, in my love, my home. And then he moves further to let us know that he, Jesus, is abiding in his father's home, his father's love. And so I thought I'd just uh, focus on the word love, abide, and, uh, and how they're in effect to abodes Jesus abode and the father's abode and they're both love and they're Jesus's love and the father's love so those are my insights on abide abode and love and thank this you. reading from John yeah thank you Colin well, that was great and if we open up our hearts to God he that abode is within us too mm-hmm Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, right on. Not yeah. about in you. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I mean, it is interesting that we keep using the word abide <laughs> throughout these translations because it has become a, a bit of a, you know, not something we hear very often. Uh, and I think, I think it's great. It's right to think about too, uh, you know, abide in my father's house. That is the love. I think you're, you're right on Collins. That's great. Um, I love that. Mm -hmm. And also I love this. You did not choose me, but I choose you. I think that is so, um, you know, it, it's so important. I don't know. I feel like that that's something that at least I feel more and more, um, in my life, the older that I get, you know, uh, and it goes back to, I think, thinking about um, that the commandments are not a burden. You know, Jesus choosing us is a great gift. Uh, the same way that um, doing God's will is a great gift in our life also. So, appreciate that. I think I always think back, um, you know, when you first come to know 
Jesus in a personal way somewhere in your life. Some people grow into it, I guess, from childhood, but, and you look back and you think that you're choosing him, you ha but you look back on it and you know that he led you all the way up to that and he chose me. You know, it's both and kind of one of those Christian paradoxes, but. Yes, agreed. <laughs> Murdoch, one of the favorite phrases in this scripture is often uh, quoted just in a half sentence. And that is, uh, whatever you ask him in my name, you know, yeah. you're going to get it. Well, if a person's having trouble uh, wondering why the person hasn't gotten what they've been asking for, perhaps maybe they ought to go meditate on the appointment mm -hmm. about what, what Jesus is saying. Look, I appointed you, Maisie. I appointed you, Laura. I, you know, Ginger, I appointed you. But I just not only appointed you, you just didn't get the appointment. I, you know, I the appointment called for you to go, mm -hmm. not just go. I know you're not just supposed to out there wander, but you're to bear fruit, like Philip did on the on that barren on that lonely road. You know, he, Philip obeyed. Philip got the message. Philip got up, went. Philip waited, and Philip's patience paid off because it bore fruit. And so my encouragement to each one of y'all, to all of us, is that uh, if we're going to be asking something for God, from God uh, in God's name, maybe it's that uh, we have the clear understanding of what God's appointing uh, us to do and, and, and how to uh, bear fruit. And fruit, not just some fruit, but fruit that will last. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very important. We can do that. Go ahead, Ginger. Sorry. We can do that when we remember that God's abiding presence is with us always. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and, and yeah, and taking that whole that whole statement in in into uh, to its context is important. Yeah. <laughs> I appointed you to go and bear fruit, and that's what you you can ask about, <laughs> basically. But we also know that 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 our our prayers are heard and answered in mysterious ways, not always how we expect them to be. Um, okay, guys. Well, it's eleven o'clock, and I want to just be respectful of our time. But I would just one more time like to to plug uh, in person lectionary. I know that a lot of people have things going on next Tuesday, but in the future, next Tuesday included. We, there will be an in-person component, uh, so look for a little bit more about that. And, and also Zoom. And uh, no, the, I'm sorry, I meant to say there's in-person and a Zoom component. Is what I meant to say. Yeah. Thank you, Ginger. Uh, there'll be a Zoom component to that. So hope to see y'all in person a little bit more now. That's a great thing. I can't wait and really appreciate everybody. And I love uh, I love being able to do this lectionary class with y'all. So. Thank you, Murdoch. Thank yeah. you, Murdoch. Thank you. Love it Thank too. you, Murdoch. All right. Bye -bye. Thank you, Murdoch. You really Good nailed it on the uh, wrapping up the epistle comments. You, that was wonderful, Murdoch. Did a great oh. job. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you, Collins. It means a lot. All right. See y'all on Bye. Zoom or in person. Bye-bye. <laughs>